And welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp, and I'm the Executive Editor for Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining today's Dataversity webinar, Data Centric Strategy and Roadmap. This year's February edition in a monthly series called Data Ed Online with Dr. Peter Aiken, brought to you in partnership with Data Blueprint. Now, floor to Megan Jacobs, the webinar organizer from Data Blueprint, to introduce our speakers to today's webinar. Megan. Thanks, Shannon. Hello and welcome. My name is Megan Jacobs, and I'm the webinar coordinator here at Data Blueprint. Uh, we've that you found the time to join us for today's webinar on building a data-centric strategy and roadmap. As a big thank you goes out to Shannon and Dataversity for hosting us. Uh, in just a few moments, after I let you know about some housekeeping items and introduce your presenters, uh, we will have one hour presentation followed by 30 minutes of Q and A. Uh, to answer as many questions as time allows, but feel free to submit questions as they come up throughout the session. To the most commonly asked questions, you will receive an email with links to download today's materials and any other information to request during the session within the next two business days. Uh, you can find us on Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn. We use the hashtag DataEd on Twitter, so if you're logged on, feel free to use it in your tweets and send questions and comments that way. Uh, we'll keep an eye on the Twitter feed and include any answers to these questions in our post-session email. Now, introduce you to our presenter and also our special guest for today. Uh, Peter Aiken is an internationally recognized data management thought leader. Many of you already know him or have seen him at conferences worldwide. He has 30 years of experience and has received many awards for his outstanding contributions to the profession. Uh, Peter is also the founding director of Data Blueprint. He has dozens of articles and eight books. Most recent is Monetizing Data Management. Presenter for today is Lewis Broom, an innovative and practice thought leader in data management, who has been creatively disrupting the approach to data management. He has 20 years of experience successfully designing, managing, implementing, and leading global data management and information technology solutions. His full track record is marked by strong leadership coupled with a passion for driving data and technology solutions from a clear business value proposition. Lewis has been published in multiple industry periodicals and is currently the CEO of Data Blueprint. The presentation is actually a preview of a workshop that Peter and Lewis will be doing at UDW. This is Peter and my business partner, Lewis, who uh, we were just looking back over, over history and discovered that the first time I had actually presented together was back in 1996, so it's been a long, successful run of us. Yeah. So I'll go ahead and get us kicked off uh, and go over the, the outline. So the, uh, the outline of the presentation. Right, so data strategy overview. This is the why, what, and how of a data strategy with the emphasis on the why. Uh, next section, uh, determining the business needs is really getting on the same page with your business partners, getting a foundation, kind understanding of the business model, and then look at specific business opportunities. So, and success criteria in business terms. Right, so this is a critically challenging and somewhat elusive activity. Um, ultimately, this is the outcome, though, that really matters most to the business. So once you understand the business needs and, and measurements of success, then we're going to talk about developing uh, the, uh, the strategy solution that fits in that box. And then finally, we'll, we'll give you an introduction on developing a roadmap and a plan. This tick along with others will be covered in more depth at EW. Just kicked off about overview of a data strategy. Some of you may have seen this video before this TED talk, and it was a uh, one uh, powerful, um, and I would highly recommend. But uh, it's basically a presentation on the power of understanding why we do things. So what we do is why you do it. So we cannot overemphasize how important knowledge this is. Uh, to agree, the better we understand uh, uh, the why, the easier it is to drive a solution. So we come back to this a lot. We see this as a problem really quite often at all kinds of levels. So uh, it's more it's more common than you can imagine. So you know that is how uh, we saw a thirty million dollar data warehouse get built and end up with a single user. And there's more to come on that. So. Um, 
So what we need a data strategy. So key for this is that you have to understand data strategy in context of strategy in general. And if we go to Michael Porter, the chart I'm showing you here on the screen, the y-axis, the one that's pointing upwards, is an innovation dimension. The x-axis, the one that's pointing to the right on your screen, is improving operations. We generally talk about effectiveness and efficiency. And like all consultants, we have a four-quadrant diagram on this, where quadrant one is where the vast majority of the companies are. They're just trying to keep the door open with little or no uh, focus around data as an asset. If you move into quadrant two, you're looking at and then increasing efficiency and effectiveness. And move to quadrant three, you're using data to create strategic opportunities. However, the skills and abilities of the team that can successfully implement something in quadrant two are completely different from the knowledge, skills, and abilities that somebody is trying to do in quadrant three. Now, most organizations, when we talk to them about data strategy, and since we do that kind of work, we get a lot of questions around this. They go and they really do want to do something around analytics, which is their word for saying innovation around data. The challenge is, of course, going directly from quadrant one to quadrant three without going through quadrant two. Do it. You can move directly from Q1 to Q3, but it takes longer, costs more, and delivers less at greater risk to the organization than if you learn to crawl, walk, and then run by going Q1, Q2, and by the way, Q2 will just save you enough tangible money that you can use to fund Q3 without having to ask for additional funds along the way. Very few of the organizations that we've worked with have mastered both Q2 and Q3, putting them in a quadrant four, very specialized category. And if your organization is thinking of doing this at all, consider yourself very fortunate because only one in 10 organizations actually has a thought around data strategies. So my data strategy, so in our view, right, we believe, as, as most of you would probably agree, the marketplace for most every industry is driving fast and furious to be information-based. So while everyone may acknowledge this, very few actually live it or operate as if it was true. Uh, our view is that the future when companies will compete on being competent, agile, and innovative with data and information. We have found there's still a wide gap between that future place and where people are today, right? Generally, people have thought of data uh, having direct impact on business value by determining which products to sell to which customers and which context, uh, but it's evolved, I think, to mean much more than that when we talk about the information economy. And here are the ways that we, we look at it. And, and first, when, you know, data and information is, is becoming part of what we buy whether it's products or services, people really are willing to pay a premium for information. So it becomes part of the thing that we're actually buying, and that is one way that companies can compete. This is that obviously information is power, you know, in, in the marketplace. So having a 360 view and situational awareness of, of you know, you're operating, whether it's suppliers or customers or regulation or whatever it may be, you know, this is, this is important. So, and the last one I think is really kind of interesting is that, you know, organizations are really being put at greater operating reputational risk, just the sheer amount of, of, of processing that they have to do of data. So, again, this is sort of talking about in our, in our current surrogacy processes and not even where we're trying to get to in the future. I mean, this is really causing companies, I think, a lot of problems and putting them at risk, and we've clearly seen some of that recently. So this, in our mind, highlights you know, why a data strategy is important. And Lewis won't say it, but he's got a great blog post out there to the bottom of the screen, so check that out. He's got a little bit more on this particular topic. Thanks, Peter. So, so putting the strategy together. So this, again, sort of highlights the, the breakdown of the presentation. So it, it, we're going to over understanding the business needs, both foundationally and specifically. Right. It's about really understanding your competitive advantage for your company because that is where is that is where the data strategy needs to align. Right. Um, so you can't really understand the goals and strategy of your organization of your business if you don't understand how they're going to be measured. And then we, again, we're going to get into this holistic solution and, and approach. Uh, the note at the bottom is is made the most important point uh, on the slide, 
really is, is that uh, we find organizational change is the biggest challenge. The companies have to think differently about their data, and uh, and it just cannot be overstated. All right. It's our biggest challenge we've encountered as we've worked through these. Yeah. So, uh, getting into determining the business needs. So, your company's competitive advantage, right? It's important to have this fundamental understanding of your organization's positioning in the marketplace. This is the foundation your company has built its success on. Uh, there are several ways to look at this, and there are a lot of business gurus out there that have come up with all kinds of frameworks of how to do that. But you can bet that this is a fundamental concept that management consultants are analyzing a business, they're thinking about this. So we're talking about thinking like a management consultant. So it's different. We often talk about we want to be the management consultants of the data management world. Uh, but you notice there's confusion around this quite often about understanding really what the competitive advantage is. Uh, maybe confusion within your own organization. An example I'm aware of is, you know, the credit card company that I know that they think they're a, a data company. Uh, at some point, a large discount retailer tried to compete by introducing some more in products, and it was, it, was a, it was just a complete flop, and it's clear to the customers. So the idea of competitive advantage that you really, maybe everybody understands it, but, but I think it's important to point out, it's not being the best. The best is sometimes referred to as a race to the bottom. Being the best means everybody is doing the exact same thing and the winner will be the one who does it the cheapest. And the idea really is to be different. So sometimes being inexpensive is a competitive advantage, but not if that is what everybody else is doing. It's about adding value in a way no one else is, whether that is being good at providing low-cost solution and creating operational efficiencies or because you have specialized skills that no one else can mimic. So again, the framework at the bottom are some examples you can use. So I'm going to get into this a little bit. So this is one of those frameworks that we look at for competitive advantage. And uh, three components of this. Uh, there's lower cost versus the differentiated. And loss is just focusing on things like operational efficiency, low cost suppliers. The differentiated is just having to focus on innovation, introducing new ideas and products, product features. Right? Another going the other way, it's narrow versus broad. So you get the four quadrants. You could be narrow, broad, you could be low cost, or you can be based on being different. And uh, it's not all it's very rare for someone to be in the center, but occasionally some people can sort of be a bit of both. So, so a quick example of this is uh, the Walmart is clearly a leader in low cost, and they uh, their market is is very broad. Um, where Whole Foods is being very different, so they're offering very different products you can't find anywhere else. Uh, they put together a unique combination of goods. But they're still being fairly broad. Trader Joe's is in that center spot where you know they're low cost, but yet they're providing um, high quality goods. So uh, Target could also potentially be. But so the key here is to get this concept and understand where your company is positioned, because again, it's probably somewhere in one of these quadrants, one of the four quadrants. So or more to the point, it's unlikely to be broaching two of them. In yeah, right. Direction. Exactly. So. so so now, if you understand how your company is positioned, the next piece is really to understand how does it specifically create that competitive advantage in that particular positioning that it's taken on, right? So everyone has a unique value proposition that gives them an advantage. That's how, that's why they've been successful. Additional will focus on what is important to the business. So again, the reason for doing this is you, you, everybody, and you hear people say a lot, the data strategy needs to align to the business strategy. But I think for us, the piece that's been missing is, well, how do I understand the business strategy in such a way that I can align my data strategy? So this is one way to do it here at Data Blueprint. So uh, I'll just get through this quickly. It's really talking about who has leverage in your particular situation. Sometimes the buyers have leverage over your organization, um, and sometimes you have leverage over your buyers. Suppliers, uh, OPEC was a great example of someone who clearly uh, was a supplier that had huge influence uh, drove the world markets, um, but specialized skills such as transplant doctors, 
you know, a type of supplier. So, and it also could be expensive to change suppliers. So, you know, who has leverage over who in the relationship between your company and the customers, the suppliers. Another component that drives uh, competitive advantage is new entrants. So how easy is it for, for a new entrant into the marketplace in which you're operating? Is it capital intensive to get in there because your airline industry, well, it's expensive to go out and get airlines. Uh, airlines. So, so are there many other options for customers if they become price sensitive to what you have to offer? Uh, and the bottom one is, or the center one is, is more uh, subjective. It's really about, uh, you know, how competitive is the marketplace, like Coke versus Pepsi. And the point of this is to have some sort of framework to get your organization's competitive advantage because more than likely their business strategy will be focused on either shoring up their strong position or trying to push back with a disadvantage. All right. Example, uh, just looking at Hyundai and Porsche. Hyundai is a, their customers are cost sensitive. Uh, it's on to a broad range of buyers. Porsche clearly very much a niche market, very differentiated. Um, so look at those two, their positions looking at the the five forces in the table, you can see how they sort of fall out. But the key point here is that in the Porsche, you know, customer data is really important to them because retention and repeat customers is really how they maintain their profits. And so they will have very specialized or, or uh, individualized relationships with their customers. So how do they manage that data? So they're really into R and to be, you know, a different and a diff a differentiated product, right? Research and development constantly developing new product features. Okay. It's kind of the opposite, right? They're very price sensitive customers. So they're really into operational efficiency. So if you're thinking about your data strategy, you know, these are the areas you want to dive into at these companies to go look for because, and it's not to say that they don't care about, you know, the course doesn't care about operational efficiencies, but if they're going to look at operational efficiency versus R and D, you know they're going to go with R and D every time. All right. So, so the takeaway: um, find out what is important to your business partners and focus there. And it makes for a smaller elephant to try and eat uh, when you're looking at at the data that we have to work with. This is an excerpt from. Uh, article for the IO update. Um, and I just thought it was interesting how their value propositions for leverage data matched up nicely to the five forces. Uh, insight and innovation, right? That's really about being differentiated, uh, establish barriers to competition, right? That's that's making it hard for, for new people to enter. Operational efficiency, again, that's around low cost providers. So, you know, it's a repeating theme that, that when you're looking at business value, these are the areas you want to look. Um, so just to quickly summarize, you know, it's useful for a couple reasons uh, because it sets a vision for why we practice data management. I think that's really important and I think that's something that, that you know, I know in my career I've struggled to do. Um, and I think many people skip this step. Uh, but in our view, it's because people look at data sometimes as having IT driven goals and not those goals. Uh, so we need the business to be more, uh, have more ownership and accountability for how we leverage data in the organization. Third summary of what essentially is an entire semester's course, how to do strategy. Uh, some may have encountered something similar in business school, but let's talk about the real world now as we, we encounter it. And when we go in to do data strategy work for organizations, we generally find that we end up with one of two conclusions that comes away. One, the organization has a great business strategy. And what that really means is that they've got a great business strategy as an organization. Then they also have a really wonderful IT strategy, and underneath that they have a data strategy, and all three are aligned perfectly and working really, really well. And we see that, what, maybe one in ten customers? The other part of it is the other nine-tenths of them are, are we find out that the strategy they have actually is either could be improved or is really not well expressed at that level. 
so that you have to apply some analysis to the process and to figure out what is their strategy. Uh, we use a lot of what's called reverse engineering analysis so that we can tell them what is the most important parts of their processing world that they're doing and how doing a lot of it seems to indicate what their strategic needs are in certain areas. And if it's not, it's a good fail for them to come back and react to. So the key if you have a business strategy that you can start to work towards, is to know what changes would be seen as useful or important and plan to do something that is useful or probably even more so than useful, useful and noticeable in the organization. Okay. So, and success criteria, during business value, um, to fully understand the organization's business goals and, and, and objectives, uh, they have to be measurable or there's not a full definition. So, um, and uh, working from a data management perspective, I've often struggled with this myself, getting at how to measure the business value. Like, how do you, how do you measure, you know, quantify the business value of data quality or enterprise data architecture? So, um, it, it, I've worked through that. We found that it takes a clear business need that can be measured to derive the value of the underlying data strategy activities. Um, and that in uh, absence of a clear value proposition, the, uh, the business value of a data strategy is unknown. So we would be looking at one side of the equation when we'd be looking at the cost side if we not measure the value on, on the business side. So. Um, the, the, to measure the value of a business opportunity is critical in the development of, this, uh, of a successful data strategy. Again, we look at another framework here, understanding really what we mean by measurement. Uh, again, there's some uh, depth that needs to be understood to really get that concept. Uh, but this object of measurement, I think, is, is really the important part uh, to the concept of understanding why. It's too often assumed that we understand what we mean when we're going to say we're going to measure customer satisfaction, or we're going to, you know, we're going to measure, uh, you know, customer retention. Uh, these end up being ambiguous once you start to get into it. So, uh, it's a Porsche. Porsche is very interested in measuring repeat customers, and Hyundai is very, very interested in measuring or counting the number of cars sold. But if someone was looking at customer satisfaction, we may get into the conversation, well, what's a customer? And so uh, a customer, you know, may be someone who actually hasn't bought from us before in that particular context. And if you don't define that, it becomes difficult or you will not really be able to get a, a measure that the business wants. So uh, that's important. And then methods of measurement really is, you know, this is your tool bag. Uh, or just the sampling uh, would be an example, Bayesian theory, uh, and others. One of my favorite inspirations around this area is a book by a fellow named Douglas Hubbard, who I just love giving a shout out on this. It's, it's a fantastic book. It's twenty-five dollars at Amazon, um, and you know, I hate to push everybody else's books instead of ours, but this is really worth reading if you're in faced with something as Lewis was just describing. If these things seem vague to you, it's probably only because we aren't practiced at it. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that he talks about specifically is when you start doing this analysis, you start to formalize stuff. And Lewis, we've had many of these discussions as we're introducing our junior associates to this process. One of the things Lewis emphasizes over and over again is rate and get down dramatically. I hope that didn't blow your speech out, everybody, but it, it's, it's emphatic there. Because the minute you have a picture in your mind, you can have something that's worth criticizing, whereas the ideas are vague and they just don't help uh, that a whole lot. A wonderful exercise in this, Chapter 7 of this book that I'm showing on the screen here now, talks specifically about measuring the value of additional information to a decision. And one of the things that he goes in and proves pretty emphatically is that most people put too many variables into their equations. Uh, try to you simplify, you actually get better results in order to do that. We're going to talk to you about how we did that on one particular customer's approach at this point. So I'll, I'll tee up the example, and this is a data blueprint example. Uh, a client of ours, an international chemical company, um, they, develop, uh, they do a lot of research and development and creating spice chemicals to go into oil and gasoline as it is. So uh, fairly large company, a billion plus, uh, basically, 
would have the customer will come to them and they sell oil uh, on on the market for people to put into their cars, and they'll come to this company and they, well, my, we want to sell oil for high performance cars that will keep the engines running cooler. And these guys will go away and, and, and customize a formulation to meet their product specifications. And so over the years, these researchers have run tens of thousands of tests uh, at, at 25,000, 250,000 each to create these formulations for customer requests. And it's, really, it's a very exciting environment because, you know, you walk through the halls and there are all these labs and their labs or a big engine block sitting on a stand with a thousand probes on it, uh, taking all kind of measures to make sure that the formulation is doing what it's supposed to be doing. So, uh, so in this case, the objects of measurement, the things that we're really focused on. Uh, um, going through this exercise that we've been talking about, test execution, customer satisfaction, and research, uh, researcher productivity. So again, what they were figuring out was we have all these tasks that we've run previously. We should be able to leverage that data in such a way that we can reduce the number of tasks that we actually have to run. Because we understand if we add a little bit more phosphorus, given the other variables in this formulation, that will run cooler at higher RPMs. And to the point of where they can almost simulate the solutions for their customers. Um, and they just, because they, they were finding that they were actually end up running essentially the same test over and over at the very expensive cost per test. So, so we talked to them about uh, the test execution, the customer satisfaction, then if they, if they could virtually formulate the solution, they were getting a quicker time to market from initial requests of certification. And then, of course, you have these PhD uh, researchers who don't have to repeat something that they've done before or that could do much quicker. So again, the number of tests that you get and five formulations per researcher were the objects and measures. So talk about how this all worked out. One of the things that, that our team did was go into a map, a process map of what was going on in the organization. And I want you to imagine the map you see on the screen now without all the circles and lines drawn around it. And even just coming up with that process map, they considered that we had done a superb job because they'd never been able to figure out what the actual process was. So here we are in an exact instance of what Lewis was saying before, write it down, and now we have something that's improvable and we can start to make sense out of it. Now, the other interesting part that happened on here, though, from a data strategy perspective, is that while we had the process map done, we then add the dimension of time. And so what you see on the right-hand side, there are six major categories of non-value-added work that these PhDs were doing. And these PhDs did a wonderful job of actually implementing this, but as data scientists, they were only about 20% productive. Their time taken up by literally transferring digital data between different machines, moving it around manually, manipulating it, doing what we call synonym reconciliation. There were tribal knowledge requirements, and at the this whole thing, the piece of red icons that you see there, it was all being run on Fox Pro, which, you know, hasn't been a product for many years. So here was a way we could add a person to their group who helped them with data management practice practices, and the entire group got to be more productive as a result, allowing them to go back to their strategic um, strategy that they had, which was, again, was whenever before, through pieces. So I just want to make one other comment about that, Peter, and, and, and make a uh, um, point that we've been talking about. So again, here's an organization that's very focused on innovation, R&D, while you know, the process here was very inefficient for the researchers. Well, useful, and they found value in that. It was the fact that they could do more research, not that they were necessarily more efficient. Again, it seems like a subtle difference, but if you were to come in and tell them, you know what, I can make this really efficient for you, so you don't have to do all these things. That's where their head is focused. Their head is focused around R and D and results and being innovative. So it, again, I think it's very subtle, but it's important in that that's how you understand that that business operates and therefore how to bring the, the value proposition to them. Cool. Of course, by putting in a data strategy that included elements of process improvement, architectural components that needed to be developed, aspects of data quality that they needed to be 
educated about and giving them a more integrated system development process. It reduced the number of tests that were needed to get them to product. It increased the number of tests available for researcher, and it reduced the time to market for new product development. And time to market turned out to be a big driver. In this case, I kind of looked at Lewis and said, they told us we saved them $25 million. We didn't charge them enough. Yeah, yeah, we left some money on the table there for sure. So, so just to summarize this section on measuring business value, um, you know, this, this concept really is a skill unto itself. So it makes sense to bring someone onto your team who has background in statistics, operations, research, financial, and someone with similar experience. But either it's a step that can't be skipped. As Peter said earlier, you know, you need to become familiar with these concepts. And you need to practice these skills. Um, you know, I, again, I think the important point is is that you can't, you know, you can't really develop the data strategy and the solution and drive business value. You, if you're not sure how the business is measuring that value. It's important that if people can understand these concepts and develop these skills, you know, it will endear you to your business partners, right? All of a sudden, you know, you're speaking a common language and you're understanding how to measure that value to so really help them measure their own success and build trust that the strategy is really important to the overall business model, which ultimately, you know, to get buy-in, you're going to need. Okay, so uh, moving into the so on developing a solution to address needs. Um, Sarah, I'm just really going to outline uh, the structure of, of this section um, now that we understand that the business needs and the measures of success. So rethinking the SDLC, this is really saying that you know you've got to think about this differently. Um, and, uh, and I, I really love how Peter uh, has has sort of formulated this idea. But then we look at the holistic part, right? This is the data strategy. I think this is the piece that most people are probably familiar with to some degree. Is okay. Well, you know, I'm going to get a holistic solution to to you know be able to better leverage data. And uh, and so we go through that. I'm going to go through it kind of at a high level of what all the components are in the description and a few examples, but. but um, at EDW, we're going to go into these in, in much more uh, depth, and, and how they they're all integrated together. Um, and then the last one is just a quick point about matching your organization's abilities to deliver. And this feeds into the uh, the roadmap uh, concept. That so um, to be successful, you can't you can't overpromise. So the first piece around this is that we've been teaching everybody in IT how to build things incorrectly. And that's a pretty brazen statement for me to make, but after studying this for 30 years, I'm, I'm really convinced. I hope you'll agree with me after these two slides. It makes sense that we should, in response to an organizational strategy, develop some specific goals and objectives so that we can see whether we are on track with that strategy or not, and whether that strategy is, in fact, achieving the results that we want. And it does make sense to the next level of thinking to say, let's talk about systems and applications that will help support the achievement of those goals and objectives. Network and infrastructure becomes a next step on that, and data and information usually become an afterthought at that point. For example, if it's step three, we decide that the answer is an ERP, then Every discussion, the network and the data part becomes about the data for that ERP and the network for that ERP. That absolutely guarantees that the data is going to be formed to the applications instead of around organization-wide requirements. Which is why we spend so much time reformatting our version of customer for the 16 different definitions that we have around the organization. But the processes are narrowly formed around those applications, and hence very little data reuse is possible. Now, back to the old days, the, the object orientation was supposed to be about reusing data. Realistically, now we are simply not reusing data, actually reusing code. And realistically, every measurement that we have shows we are not reusing code. If you thought about which would be easier to reuse, a piece of data that's well-defined or a piece of code that's rather poorly described, and, and the answer, of course, is data. So shift here, and a very subtle one again, as, as Lois mentioned before, if you march with your strategy, objectives perfectly fine but next let's develop organization-wide information requirements these are assets that the organization needs to manage they've put a lot of time and money into getting them to that stage let's make sure they actually can then we can do network and infrastructure and then and only then 
should we talk about systems and applications? This is a cleaner approach, a less complicated approach to systems development than the way we've talked about it before. It means that the data assets can be developed from an organization-wide perspective that the system supports the organizational needs instead of the other way around, and we can maximize our data and information reuse. If we don't do it this way, the alternative, the traditional systems development life cycle, is guaranteed to produce more small piles of data, and that's what we don't want to have. So, and Peter, again, I just I think these slides because it, you know in this information, this approach, you know, I it all the time when we're talking to new clients and existing clients, and it's just hugely powerful. But in the in the context of the data strategy, clearly, you know, data and information being clear to the goals and objectives and the strategy. And now it makes more sense. The data strategy now makes more sense, right? Because it is the thing that falls out of the, the business piece that sits at the top. So when we look at this from that perspective, we also have to talk about who's involved. And I really leadership should be there. Some sort of piece that reports with the business lines that talks about how data as an asset should be used to achieve the organizational objectives. In addition to that, and this is simply a relatively new development. I say that in the sense that we haven't been having data governance conversations uh, around this. We used to call it something different, but governance has actually gotten some very good uh, uh, out there in this field. Uh, we also have a bunch of different stakeholders, our CX levels, CEO, CFO, COO, CIO, et cetera, et cetera lines of business, senior managers, and, and team leads, all of these are going to be stakeholders that are going to have a role to play in the development of your strategy. Finally, of course, you need to have the data team, again, architects, modelers, developers, analysts, and stewards. Stewards in particular here, because stewards are the ones that are going to be charged with implementation of the strategy in the very near future. The part of this, though, we've seen recently a need for a new individual called a chief data officer here. The chief data officer is the person who can guarantee that the applications group doesn't start developing things until they have organization-wide definitions of the data. One of the questions you get here at Data Blueprint often enough is, I'm going to make my agile processes go faster. And the only way to make agile speed up is by taking data out of it. That's another whole topic. We could talk about that some other time. But again, what we have is the true analysis process is told incorrectly to everybody who's taken it. So we've trained smart people wrong. The data job should be coordinating with the top information technology jobs through a data governance organization. And this will allow them now to start getting better at the process. Again, our focus here on the CDO is that they should be dedicated 100% to data asset leveraging. They should be unconstrained by IT project mindset and report directly to the business. And it's the book in the bottom right <laughs> corner. Peter has a book out there. Oh, right? Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, it's uh, the case for the chief data officer. So, okay. Um, so, uh, so again, we're uh, we're going to and talking about the different really components that make up a, a data strategy. Peter just talked about people. So, data determine what is important. Uh, this is a really important concept and sometimes not understood. Not all your data is important. Using the business needs and success criteria we've talked about, you know, will help to identify the scope of the data needed as part of your overall uh, data strategy solution. Uh, here, uh, we've listed the, the meta types of data as, as we think of them. I'm sure someone else could have a different take, uh, you know, have a lot more, you know, maybe slightly differently, but our collective years of designing, developing, global systems under different circumstances and contexts, you know, these are the ones that make sense to us. It always comes back to looking at the data in these buckets, whether it's architecture, governance, or quality control. We have data strategy that is really fully focused on the consumption side of these meta types. So a lot of times it's looking at reporting analytical data and metadata um, and maybe some of the master data. So you know, we're proposing that the data strategy really needs to consider all the, the, the meta types, traditional data, event data as well. Are the sources for reporting analytics? Uh, you know, master data impacts the transactions and events as much as it does reporting analytics. So the point here really is that all types are really interrelated to create holistic 
ecosystem and data stride needs to support the concept. Uh, so, Peter, I, I thought you invented Rod, apparently not, but if you could talk about that. I wish I could figure out where we actually got it from, um, but Rod stands for data that is redundant, obsolete, or trivial. And what that means is that it turns out when we measure it, 80% of data out there is redundant, obsolete, or trivial. It means it just gets in the way of your decision-making process. So one of the things we can help to do with the data strategy is figuring out what data is important, why it's important, and what we have to do to make it more useful around us. Again, if you don't have that handled, then we're trying to take on a problem that's 5x times the size yeah. that we normally like to do it. And while that's fine for consultants, uh, you know, we tend not to get paid by the hour. We get paid by the project. That's right. So you're wondering what that picture is in the, on the slide. That it's some rot. It's some rot. <laughs> so, uh, so Nick talked about people, and we talked about data, talked about data management practices. Uh, so actually, we're going to walk you through all the components of the technical and foundational practices that you can see there in the wheel on the right-hand side. Um, helping the data strategy, the important point is to understand which of those components are needed and to what degree they needed to support the data strategy. Here's a little examples along the way. Yeah, and we'll, we'll talk about those. So, I mean, but these are integrated concepts, and they need to be thought of like that. Um, here today, we're just going to walk through each one of them and introduce each one, and uh, we'll be diving into these a lot more at the workshop at EDW, giving more definition and showing how they work in concert together. But just a quick note, um, in order to data, there are other data management practices uh, not covered here, data security, business continuity, or two uh, clearly mentioned. These important components, and this view could be expanded to include those, especially if they're important to your business. And, and, and she has been something that's, that's been on the forefront of, of newspapers lately. Um, but I just make that comment. So the key for these foundational practices is that we find when we go in and help groups either untangle the mess that they have or plan something, Thing, to focus too narrowly on one instead of our, our foundation, at least three pieces. So people get fixated on a data warehouse, and they think the data warehouse is going to solve the problem. It turns out the data warehouse could, in fact, solve the problem. But we've seen lots of very well functioning data warehouse failures because lots of functions, but they've forgotten the other pillars that go into this. I'll give you an example in just a second here. But think of it. Always, if you're not incorporating at least three of these practices around, you're probably not seeing enough of the picture on this. So, on this is a healthcare data warehouse we saw uh, at one point, and it took them about 18 months and $30 million to build this. And we dove into it because we were asked to, to take a quick evaluation of it. There were almost 2 million members, but almost 1.5 million providers. So, it was almost a provider per member. Sounds like a great state to go live in. On the other hand, in this data warehouse, 800,000 of the 1.4 million providers had no primary key, which meant we couldn't access them if we wanted to. And we're still, this entire data warehouse ended up having one user. So imagine the volume and forcefulness with which the CEO said to me, I could have taken a room full of MBAs and accomplished this analysis much more quickly. So just again, keep tying it back to the theme of the data strategy and tying this in with, with the business. You know, I, we find that if a solution is taking forever to implement or if it's overly complicated, it's only because you don't understand why you're doing it. You really don't understand the drivers of the solution. So I, I'm almost always, if I walk into a, a new environment and someone is struggling, trying to implement some system for two years and it's taken them forever to do it, it's because they really don't know why they're doing it and what the requirements are. So if they do finish, they'll probably build a great solution that would have been wonderful two years ago. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Okay. So look at this. The foundational practice is so data strategy is one of the foundational practices. Again, we've already talked about aligning with the business strategy and the operational model, and this is going to become even more important as we do this. But gosh, again, another call that we get here at Data Blueprint a lot is people want us to develop a big data strategy for them. And say We'd be able to do that. What's your data strategy? And we don't know and we don't care. And it's like, no, 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 that's the wrong answer. 
Uh, again, we want to be very careful in terms of working through this. You don't want a big data strategy if you don't have a data strategy in the first place. Other foundational practice then is architecture. Again, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but when you explain what a data architecture does to the organization, if you talk in terms of developing a common vocabulary so that everybody, when they talk about certain concepts, they know what they mean because they're formalized, what the purpose of a data architecture is to help you get on that same page. Our observation is that most organizations have data assets that are not supportive of the strategy. The question becomes how can they more effectively use their architectures to support the strategy implementation. Another key piece to all of this, again, 10 years ago, we might have said, well, we have data governance covered in data administration, but it's been a lot more successful since we've bring it out and addressed it explicitly. Uh, the key there is to avoid data governance, and I, I've got a fellow in my class uh, for one of those credit card companies as well, who says, oh gosh, you're giving me more, more reasons to say no to people. Well, that's not what governance should be about. It's about saying no. It, should, it may be a, a sense that sometimes you have to say not yet, but no is really not where you want to be. Governance is the idea that we're going to be treat data as an asset. After all, you have fiscal governance in your organization, you have all kinds of disciplines that you put in place that we need to make sure these are the right ones. Okay. So, uh, so again, there are two components to the data management practices, the foundational and the technical practices. Uh, so we'll introduce some of the technical practices here. They're really all about building stuff, right, how, and how to go about it in a holistic way. We keep talking about thinking like an engineer, um, you know, uh, using architecture. And you know, if you've done all the other part of the strategy well, this starts to become self-evident. Uh, it needs to happen. Again, if you're struggling to figure out what the technical solution should be, um, I would go back and look. Uh, it doesn't mean that there won't be technical challenges. It just means if you're having uh, a challenge figuring out what you need to do, then you probably, that should be a flag. Um, so we're going to, as we talk through this, we'll talk about some uh, examples as well. So data quality being one of the technical practices. The, this is where knowing what data is important is, is, is critical to data quality because we've talked about at the very beginning, huge amounts of volumes uh, of data in our organizations. It's, it's just flooding in and, uh, you know, it can't all be correct, standardized all the time. So that's where, uh, you know, if you want to put controls and governance in place, you need to do it for your most important data elements. And, and this is uh, that only way that we've ever seen being really successful with data quality. But at the same time, you'd be really surprised about how much your organization would run if there are a few key data elements with great quality controls and governance around them. And then you could take something like a customer ID. And if a customer can be uniquely identified consistently across a whole organization, that organization could probably just change in, in so many ways that they hadn't even dreamed of. And so it's not like you have to fix everything maybe about the customer, but if you could just identify the customer or types. So uh, I had uh, worked with a particular company where, you know, the customer type where they managed it well, or someone who managed customer data, didn't report up through the I.O., uh, report directly to somebody at executive level. If you wanted to add a new data type for customer, you had to go through about a three-month adjudication process, uh, and it was a big deal. And, and But because you do that, they could share customer data, they could roll up customer data, and it, it really was a, a beautiful thing. So, but the other key point on this slide is, and I don't know how many people get into this situation, but, you know, if you have data quality problems and you figure out where, what they want to manage, the root cause. The find and fix is just, you know, while it may seem like you can make progress in the short term, over the long term, it isn't sustainable and you can never really get ahead of it. So it's worth the effort while it will look great maybe at the beginning to go fix the root cause, but it is uh, the only way really to deal with the data quality issues you want to fix. Question two, this is a of requirements that is not typically well done. So when we talk about a data strategy, 
we don't tend to express the explicit integration requirements that are there. We kind of draw some pictures up and say this stuff should all talk to each other, but talking to it is not really the same thing as integration. And data turns out to have it be perfect at the most atomic level or it won't integrate. Again, half a character or a number off is going to result in a different object being pulled. So the idea to gain insight is to gain integration. And the more and the broader we can focus our integration efforts, the easier it becomes to achieve our data strategies. So uh, data platforms, so really about decoupling the functionality using these engineering architectural concepts we keep talking about. Um, and and we have two examples Peter will talk about. Uh, uh, one cloud, but um, um, related to migrating from legacy platforms to, to new, newly engineered data platforms. Uh, one example I want to talk about is unwinding a ma mainframe in a high volume transactional environment. The business strategy for that was that they wanted to efficiently uh, uh, process those transactions, high transaction volume. So the more, more people had to touch the transactions, the more people had to do to figure out. If they needed to touch the transactions, uh, the less efficient they were. So the, the best strategy there was for for high operational efficiency, and and that translated into straight through processing concepts in terms of the overall design and architecture. So the straight through processing of transactions means minimize the amount of human intervention that's required to process those transactions, and so that. What we're able to do then is you have to then enable that those transactional, uh, you know, which is really a, a set of data. That you have to figure out what data components, whether it be exception management or some type of lifecycle management or master data, that, that would enable that straight through processing. So these data platforms uh, really, you know, driven from your business strategy, uh, you know, become very, very evident. So there's one of the, the examples I remember you told me earlier on too was you're working with a trading system and the link was not, the, the the constraint was not so much the number of trades they could do but the number of errors that they kicked off that they couldn't process so well. So by reducing the errors, you were able to increase the volume of that trading system by a very significant amount. But again, you know, the errors were being created essentially because master data was wrong and they didn't know really whether it was an error or not. So another whole talk that we can do. Yeah. Uh, just another bit about platforms here. You'll see this a lot where people are trying to get their data into the cloud. And the typical word that they use to describe that process is forklift. Uh, Lewis, there are a couple of other words that you use to describe it too, but it's just taking your data and jamming it into the cloud. It's great for the cloud vendor. So we say that if you're going to put your data in the cloud, did have three da three attributes data in the cloud that it doesn't have outside the cloud. One, there should be less of it in volume just based on the rock that we've talked to you about. I hope you all agree that the data in the cloud should be cleaner than the data outside of the cloud. If it's not, what's the point? And finally, it should be engineered to be more shareable. And those three attributes make a huge difference in terms of the platform. Okay, so the uh, the here on the technical practices uh, business intelligence. So we really think of this as reporting and analytics. This is a spectrum of, of really that consumption. Uh, it's at the end of the food chain, really, of, of the data. And this is clearly highly dependent on um, the owners, right? This is all about integration. This is all about platforms, quality, uh, metadata, uh, so. And it's obvious when this is not done well, right? Because there are spread marks everywhere and there are shadow IT solutions built by your operational staff using Microsoft Access. So you can pretty much walk into an environment and determine very quickly how a business intelligence solution has been developed. If uh, people are having to create a basically beginning to end Act system every time they need a new report, you know that uh, it's not working. But um, clearly, this is you know this is exploratory in nature. Uh, the, the, this intelligence tends to be uh, you want to develop in an agile method. You want to put things in front of the users, have them react because typically once they get answers to to one set of questions, they begin to have a new set of questions right behind that. Um, 
again, this is something that's highly dependent on governance, quality, metadata in order for it to work really well. Component to all this is that you've got to have an idea of how your data strategy is going to interact specifically with your business. And the goal here is that we want to tie it to specific business processes. A tool that some of you are familiar with is a CRUD matrix, but let's talk about how the CRUD matrix actually works. The CRUD matrix talks about whether the data that's in the center of the matrix is created, read, updated, or deleted by various business processes that are going, in this case, across the top of the matrix. So when we do this, we understand scope, we understand use data, we understand life cycle pieces. All of these things are important to this, and your strategy can get down and say, we're going to start acting these processes in one form or another. Let me give you another example on this as well, which is that when you're trying to decide what technology selection to get, again, a platform piece, Typically what happens to most of the data issues in there is that when you discover the software that match your organizational practices, you then have more choices. You can change the software, you can change your business practice, you can do some combination of the both, or you can ignore the problem. But what do you get guidance to do this? A data strategy would have revealed the problem in advance of selecting that particular approach. So the example I'm showing here is one that we've used a lot. A person can be an employee. A uh, person can be multiple employees. In this case, we're explicitly building a system that permits moonlighting, but all in that is going to give you simpler reporting. Again, we can do a lot more on that. We won't. The key is that as you understand these business practices around this, you can take these components of data management, and I've got them listed here, program coordination, integration, stewardship, development, and operations, and start to match them up. Because if you don't match them, you end up with some numbers like this. And these are just came from one particular group here, where we have lots and lots of things that are happening. If they're happening a lot and not optimized, then your organization is going to suffer death by a thousand cuts. So when we summarize this particular piece, what we're really trying to do is to get people to think differently about the solution, not how we've taught them. It's a holistic process focusing on people management, technology, and processes. It addresses the gaps to give sustainable solutions. And most importantly, it's matched to your organization's ability to deliver crawling, walking, and running, which is our final section we're getting into. Yeah, thank you. So develop a roadmap and, and plan, and again, we're really introducing the topic here with the expectation we're going to get into it in depth at EW. So uh, really when we're talking about the implementation plan roadmap, uh, we're, we're saying that a project plan with, with you know, the early start date and the late finish date, we're really talking about the approach uh, to implementation, um, you know, what's the long-term vision for how this will be executed, uh, what are the key milestones, it just needs, the important part here is it needs to be achievable, realistic in the organization's uh, capabilities. It run into this time and time again, go into organizations where you know, they, they're just trying to do too much uh, given their, their level of capabilities. So Peter, uh, his crawl, walk, run concept and, and how that's applied, I think, is absolutely perfect and we have found People gotten burned by trying to do too much. They come back to this, and it makes complete sense. So you're looking at what in terms of crawling, and this is the message that you want to have in your strategy too: is that we haven't done this in the past. We need to start, but we're not going to go from zero to sixty miles an hour in two seconds. So crawling is identifying the opportunities and determining a just large scale scope allows learn to occur. Again, remember back to the four quadrant model. Move from quadrant one to quadrant two and focus in on developing the ability to take data management and derive specific tangible amounts of money that people in the corner offices will pay attention to. Walking then may be better at that particular process, optimizing it, and then running is the fun part where we get into all the analytics and stuff like that. And by the way, if you've saved enough money in quadrant two, quadrant three pays for itself. The benefits, and I think Peter's pretty much touched on these. Uh, uh, allows, and the last point being the foundational components to be developed.
developed one currently executing tactical solutions. So with that, I think the end of the content was the top of the hour. Now it's time for your questions here. And again, this will be played out in excruciatingly more detail at our uh, session. We hope to see everybody in Austin because it's a wonderful, fun town to have a lot of fun and interact with hopefully about 800,000, excuse me, 800,000, 800 other data managers. Seems like 800,000 some days. Uh, we get in there on Sunday afternoon and we don't leave until Thursday and it's a full week. So, Megan, turn it over to you for the questions. I'll okay. sure on that one, Lewis. <laughs> Thank you, Peter and Lewis. That was an awesome presentation. Now it's time for everyone's uh, questions. It's time for the Q&A. So uh, just click on the Q&A window feature at the top of your screen. Uh, you should be able to submit your questions through that Q&A window. And we've actually had a few questions already come in, so we can go ahead and jump right into it. Um, the first question is, what are your comments on an IT shop, which is completely cutting data specialists out of the picture, because the only thing valued is speed of application delivery? What consequences of this approach? Can it succeed? We can agree that this is a shooting yourself in the foot sort of strategy. Um, one of the things we talk about is putting the eye back in IT. And when you throw all your data specialists out, you're really focusing in on T. And T can do things really, really well, but it can mess things up really, really fast as well. So we definitely advocate a, an approach that says make sure you've got qualified individuals in your organization to do this. Am I allowed to move the, yeah. uh, go back to the slides? So this is my first time. I you know what number it is, so you can but, No, I don't, but uh, I think it's a great question and, and see it all the time. And it gets back to the, these slides here. So this really what went on is that uh, I think the question is around this, uh, this in here where, uh, well, I can't get to the right one. It's right one. It's where it at the bottom. There you go. Um, um, I think it's a challenge because, it, to me, that, that just screams that the organization is struggling to see the role where data plays in the organization. And, and so they're looking at it as being something that comes after systems application development. Uh, there's not an easy answer to that. I think you know, I would take these two slides and see if you could even have some conversations around that. But it is about getting data to be the thing that you focus on because as Peter says, as soon as you buy SAP as your application, then all the other conversations from there on are about what SAP does and doesn't do and how it does it. And there's no conversation saying, what information does my organization need regardless of what system that we, we end up purchasing? So, um, yeah, whoever asked that question, if you'll identify yourself, I'll send you a pre-production copy of the CDO book. There's a lot of good arguments in there. See if that doesn't help turn things around. Next question is, do you recommend that data governance ownership sit in the IT organization? That's a great question. Um, our ideal approach is that data governance is a shared function between business and IT, but to correct for past errors, we advocate that the leadership of that organization report into the business. It's not so much that the IT people don't know what they're doing, but it's that if we can help to educate the business and make them understand that they have a stake in this and that it's, their reputation is just can't do without them, um, then definitely we, we, we want to try error in this case to correct for some of the past errors where we've had. Then did the question from the person before was very indicative of this. They clearly didn't see the value that these individuals were producing and they're de-emphasizing it, whereas they can measure the lines of code that are produced by their agile teams and they like that. So one thing that, and this isn't directly related to the question, but kind of, and, and but I wanted to mention the presentation because a lot of times, you know, to deal with data governance, we apply the crawl, run concept and, and it's, we call it little g. So what we end up doing is, is because people, we find that, that people will go away and, and a lot of work create an 80 page document about how the uh, governance should work and who's going to play what role. And it just becomes a, just a very large task without really having any practice at governance at all. So we think it's important to, to and crawl as an example would be to pick a single data element that the business and IT and the data team can work on together 
maybe customer ID or maybe it's some other key data element and what are the governance rules and what are the business rules around that and start off with some little G and build into to the larger G over time. Yeah, unless we can extend that uh, a little further. We had a hospital group that we worked with recently that uh, decided admission date was the place that they wanted to start and they found about seven different definitions of admin date, which was kind of low for an organization. But they also found that by using multiple definitions of admission date, the hospital was leaving literally millions of dollars on the floor because they weren't able to correctly bill for the services that they were putting out. Yeah, huge yeah. example. So again, I think going back to if people just have a hard time when they look at their whole, whole you know, uh, inventory of data assets of, of trying to, to figure out how to tackle the whole thing, really, you know, once you start to look at it, you'll find that 5% uh, or less of your data make a huge difference in, you know, uh, in your organization. It's all about leverage. Yeah. Okay, somebody um, asked the question, for those of us that are unable to attend the conference, how can we get the presentation slides for the conference? And um, pretty much if you want to come back to or go to the Data Blueprint website, um, check that. We'll have the slides posted closer to the actual conference, so end of April. Um, so just keep an eye on, on that. Um, and so another question for you guys is, uh, what is the best way to develop business-relevant analytics that can be put to good use? So strategy is what guides that. That should be one of the goals of strategy is to say, not just we're doing data for data's sake, as, as Lewis says, but in fact to say, this data strategy is designed to achieve these business values, this yeah. value, and those objectives are tangible and meaningful to people in the C-suite. So it, it would suggest that even, you know, the, the concept of of data, we're supposed to be exploratory, and I'm supposed to be, you know, we're supposed to be discovering new things that we didn't know before. Still has some directional um, component to it, or direction, you know, direction from a business strategy perspective. So, um, because you can't just, you know, to do big data for big data sake, it's in it this a lot where people built a data warehouse, and you go in, and they don't know why they built the data warehouse. They knew that they wanted it for reporting. And, and that they wanted to be able to, to you know, look, uh, have better reporting, basically. And, and it ended up that, that when they built it, they didn't know why they built it, and therefore it wasn't adding value. So, so I think, again, I, I just can't overemphasize the, the crawl, walk, run approach to, to you know, business analytics, uh, and especially business analytics, because that is very much an exploratory, put something together, get some feedback. And so that means a lot of foundational work needs to be done so, so that you can get into that, that sort of rhythm with your business users of presenting them stuff, seeing what questions that that answers and find out what new questions they have. But they're going to want to be able to trust the data. They're going to want to be able to, you know, see an integrated view. So doing some of those foundational things will position you better, I think, to, to get to business analytics and, and to be able to work with your users eat more easily. And if guided by a strategy, another important component can be, uh, hey, look, the reason we're doing the, the reason what we're doing today is different from what we were doing in the past is because in the past we used to follow an old SDLC, and that produced a certain level of results. But if we instead, for example, put into our strategy that we are going to fail three times in the time that most people would take to build it once, we will get better at that particular process because we have the opportunity to iterate where other organizations try for a big bang approach and again miss it entirely, which then people say, well, what the heck was the point? So, and Meg, if I can, can just continue to make this a long answer and, and, um, and we're, we're beating the, the whole year of, of data strategy, but, you know, I think the important thing to realize, and especially with business analytics, is, um, you know, there is something important to the business. And you know what's important uh, if you measure it. If the business is measuring it, you know it's important. So that's the thing that you're looking for. That's the thing you want to go after uh, when you're looking at business analytics. What does the business measure? How do they measure their success? And they may even be doing it in a spreadsheet, but that's the thing you want to go after. I would, would refine that a touch, though, because the things they're measuring are things that are important to them. What we need to find out is what they value after those measurements, though. And so, again, get up, 
beyond that first layer of management where you're collecting these aggregate statistics. Uh, the example I use uh, many times is that if we paid shirt salespeople um, by number of orders that they had, every order would contain one shirt because people are very efficient at maximizing their particular measures. That may not be the measure that you want to use, although so the things that are measurable should be the candidates from which we can take the level constructs and put them together. Okay, we have some more questions rolling in. The next one is, you spoke about a common language in semantics. Is clinical a dirty word in the current IT environment? <laughs> We're both chuckling on that one. So I think the answer to that's generally yes, and it shouldn't be. And canonical sounds like it's sort of biblical, and you know, people don't want to get into that because it, it implies that there's sort of a, a war about arguing about definitions, and that's not what we're talking about. Uh, what we are talking about is practicality, saying if we're not speaking the same language, we will run into some problems uh, in there. Yeah, I don't really have a lot that I, I agree, Peter, with, with what you're saying. Yeah. Again, and what we tend to see in this industry is that people will get fixated on an idea. Uh, five years ago, we might have said that master data management was falling into that same category. Oh, everybody's got to have master data management. I can remember explaining the concept to a, a, a wizened friend of mine who says, oh, you're just implementing the concept that some data is more important than others? Yeah, absolutely, we should do that. And we have a master and transaction file that would go all the way back in the 1950s to use uh, on this sort of thing. So, so by the way, your data management didn't ruin anybody, but I've seen a lot of failed master data management implementations. We would never try to take you down an analytics path unless you had some concept, particularly the straight through processing that Lewis was talking about. It's impossible to do without master data management. Absolutely. Okay. For that, if you can't make the uh, conference, is actually a video only that you can do um, if the attending isn't an option. So there's that. Cool. Yeah, that's pretty hot. Huh? Our question is, let's see here, who is accountable for metadata management? It's a great question, and the short answer is everybody, but of course that doesn't help. That's why we got into this situation in the first place. I like to say that the language of data governance is metadata. If you're not expressing your data governance goals and objectives, going all the way back into your strategy, in metadata management, in terms that are, are specifically identified as pieces of metadata, then you risk that disconnection. You, the gaps occur. Things start to drift. Uh, if, again, I, I can't say it any simpler than that. The language of data governance is metadata. I think, you know, Peter, my perspective, and, and, and for everyone, in the things I've built, you know, metadata really matters when you're doing business intelligence and reporting of some sort. At that point, you know, you're so much touching the business that the business has such a, a big role to play, but they really in all your data. But that really is, the, in any ways, uh, part of that common language is the, and, and semantics. and figuring out what the data really means to the business is in that layer. And it's when the data is being consumed. Now, I understand there are other types of metadata that can help drive processing and, and that can help you manage the overall uh, environment from a technical perspective. But really where the business value is, when the people are able to consume the data, is, is at that, that point is where the definition needs to be managed. Um, and there's no way around that the business has to be so involved in that or, you know, you know, there's just no way that a data person or IT person can really define the metadata for someone else. Let me add one more piece on that, Lewis. So, now this is one I keep meaning to make a slide I haven't gotten to, but it turns out the business actually understands metadata a lot more than the executives in the organizations do. And I'm not saying bad things about the executives, but you'll find that when we go out and find shadow IT shops in the business, you know, the guy with the SQL Server under his desk who says, you caught me, but please don't tell IT that I've got this yeah. system running here. That individual absolutely understands metadata. They may not know the name for it, right. but when you start to talk to them about it, they instantly grasp the concept. Right. So very definitely, the, the this is largely responsible for pushing some of these topics and also for providing the actual words, the vocabulary that we're going to use in there. Helpful. Okay, next question is, uh, how long would it take to go through the foundational steps 
larger departmental group of a company, their manufacturing org. Develop a strategy. So the engagement process should be something along the lines that Lewis has described before, which is to say, first of all, what is the business strategy in there? Hopefully there's an IT strategy driving that. And then we want to look at what, what the format of their data assets is. What are the characteristics of the assets? that they have. Taking that particular process, learning from the strengths and weaknesses of their existing data pool, and everybody has some strengths and some weaknesses, we can then come back to that IT strategy in conjunction with the business strategy and say, how do we leverage data in there best for that organization? The process can be done in literally a number of weeks, and I don't mean full-time weeks, but it does take some time to uh, assess and to assimilate this. To, some just learning a new so business. Just to get some metrics not. around that, yeah. Peter, you know, because you know we this is you know our bread and butter in many ways. So, in, in a large organization that has you know the world operates in silos, so it'll have multiple business units, um, and even if those are products or administrative silos, um, but in a business unit in a large organization, we'll spend anywhere from eight to sixteen weeks developing the overall strategy. Uh, so if you're just looking at foundational pieces, you know, it could be potentially a subset of that, but still that upfront work of understanding the business needs and the measures, it still has to be fully done. It's just the solution that you actually develop could be smaller. And I think actually, you know, it's a really good question because a lot of times we get asked to do strategies. Uh, we are, you know, how much to do for me by Friday? No, no, it's not that. <laughs> it's, you know, but it's very focused around, you know, a particular area. And it will be clear to them why they need architecture. Or it'll be very clear to them why it's, it's mostly around quality. Now, all those things will have multiple components, you know, foundation technical components involved, but it becomes clear that there is kind of a focus in on what they're looking for, what is needed, but we still, you know, we just will beat up our, our, our customers and to the point we understand what it is they're trying to solve from a business perspective, or we'll say to them, we don't know how to do that. Oh, oh we, do. we have a question. It's uh, what are carrots to get an organization to begin to put business rules, data standards, data models, and writing with transparency? I'm saying that data is an organization's sole, non completable, non degrading durable strategic asset. And unpack that particular phrase, you'll understand that data is the only asset that organizations have that doesn't degrade over time. You can't use it up. And it is a durable asset, which means it needs to be treated differently from a financial perspective than a non-durable asset or a, uh, in case, an office consumable type of uh, a process. If that argument doesn't get to them, then I go back to the CDO book where I ask a couple of really insightful questions like, Who's doing this? If nobody, if, if if nobody's doing this organization, how is this function occurring? How are these types of things going? Um, it's kind of a difficult process, but there are a couple of key questions that you can ask that will really start to to identify that. So I, I think, just, you know, say it, and 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 I guess we assume this, right? But the data strategy is a top-down approach to improving um, it, or making data. More leverageable within an organization, right? And and sometimes organizations just aren't ready for that. And if you're looking for to take care, of, you know, to me that almost is more of a bottoms up approach. And it would certainly understand that, you know, and that is a valid approach as well. Um, you know, it's it. And so some of the things that we look at are in, when you talk about standards or quality, and what's the care is that typically the low-hanging fruit is uh, operational efficiency. So we call it non-value-added work. So it can look for those areas where, you know, in our example of the PhD researchers at the chemical company, you know, literally, I, I'm not kidding, 70% of their time was spent manipulating the data just so that they could go be big data scientists. Seven percent of guys who God knows how much they make, you know, is spent manipulating. I mean, when I say manipulate, well, you saw the diagram. So it's where um, the typical low-hanging fruit is. You can start to give them a carrot. Uh, you know, I can eliminate so many hours a day. I 
across the team of 20 people and that adds up to this much money, those are typically the easier things to find. Um, but that isn't, you know, um, you know, that's a bottoms up approach as opposed to the top down strategy approach. Both can work, but top down is more favorable. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there are no more questions, but um, some great questions came in for guys. It was a great presentation. Um, thank you, everyone, for participating in today's event. We hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, thanks again to Dataversity and Shannon for hosting us. Uh, once again, you will receive today's materials within the next two business days. Our webinar this month will be Emerging Trends and Data Jobs. Uh, hopefully, you'll be able to join us for that as well. And as always, feel free to contact us if you have any questions. Everyone, and have a great, great day. Peter, thanks, Lewis, and thanks, Megan, for another fantastic uh, presentation. Just love it and love and thank everyone for attending and for all the great interaction and questions. And again, as Megan said, I hope everyone has a great day.